Now, we've been uh, looking at the book of Revelation. We have a divine outline given to us in chapter 1 and verse 19. John is instructed to write the things which he had seen, which was the glorified Christ. It was in chapter 1 that he saw the glorified Christ. He said, write the things which you have seen. And then he says, write the things which are, and that represents for us chapters 2 and 3. For therein lies the panoramic view of the church age. And we saw that it will culminate in a time of a Laodicean spirit, a people rule spirit, where churches begin to do what the people tell them to do rather than what God's Word says and what the pastors are leading them into. And we saw that that was going to be the final stage of the church age. And if you don't see that today, you're not looking because churches today ask the people, put their finger to the wind like politicians and say, what will serve us? And then they give the people what they want. Uh, Bible tells us in First Timothy or Second Timothy that men are going to, in the last days, heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, not willing to endure sound doctrine. The book of Revelation brings for us sound doctrine about the last days, and some people just don't want to hear it. They want to put their fingers in their ears, put their head in the sand, and say, I don't want to hear that. It's frightening. Well, it's good that we be frightened a little bit in a day where they're trying to desensitize us. So let us go there with our eyes open and our hearts engaged because Jesus is the winner. If we know him as our Savior, we're the winners. It's going to be okay. And we also are motivated to live a more holy life as we see things culminating. At the end of chapter 3, or uh, yeah, chapter 3 in verse 19, Jesus says these words to the church of Laodicea in the last days. He says, if you want to know if you're saved or not, in essence, he's really putting that out there. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. And many people get away with sinning. They go to church and they think it's okay because they pray to prayer. Well, that's good that you pray a prayer. Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But some people call from their head, perhaps with this idea that if I just say some magic words, it's okay. That's not prayer. That is kind of negotiating a deal. <laughs> it's, it's not what God wants. God wants us to engage the heart. When we see that our sin will create a, a havoc on our future and, it, and our destiny, we realize we need saving. And then when that, uh, that kicks in, we begin to realize Jesus is the Savior. And he says, if you're saved, you're going to be rebuked and chastened. So everything about the Laodicean age really is wound down by that verse. So that's an important verse for us to remember. Chapter 1, verse 19, the divine outline. Chapter 3, verse 19. 19, the admonition to our age. Chapter 4 began for us the things which shall be hereafter. This represents for you and for me the, the 70th week of Daniel. If you have in your margin there, uh, Daniel chapter 9 and verse uh, 24 through 27, you would do well. For it is there that we're told Israel had a history of 70 weeks of years, which is 490 years. On the 483rd year, Jesus literally arrived as predicted 483 years prior. The and Messiah was predicted to be coming to Jerusalem, coming to Israel as their Messiah. But it says after 483 years, Messiah would be cut off. Jesus came on the triumphal entry on the 483rd year to the day. That is awesome. Within a week, he was cut off, as Daniel chapter 9 tells us. And then subsequently, it says that the city and that the uh, sanctuary would be destroyed. And that in the end of the desolations would come like a flood. And what's, what we're seeing there is the 69th year and the 70th year separated. Uh, the 70th week of years. In that interim, you have Jesus being cut off. You have the sanctuary being destroyed. That happened in 70 AD, about 38, 37 years later. So this parenthesis was going to take some time. What we have for us in chapters 4 through about chapter 19 is Daniel's 70th week back on, on track, if you will. And what we have is an amplified view of what's going to happen during those, those days of devastation. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. And this is because Israel kind of fumbled the ball in a big way throughout their history, and especially toward the end of their history, just prior to the Lord's, uh, Lord's crucifixion. 
And so God has a plan for Israel. He's going to bring them back. In 1948, we have what we might call the super sign that Israel was, in fact, gone from 70 A.D. until 1948. In 1948, Israel came back. Huge, huge deal. Because many people had written them off, said they were done, transferred many of the promises to the Israelites onto the church, started even referring to the church as God's Israel. We're not God's Israel. We're Jesus' bride. We are here as a unique group of people brought out of the nations to be the bride of Jesus. And what they were supposed to have been doing, the Israelites were supposed to have been doing, was preparing the way for the bridegroom to come and receive his bride. You may remember John the Baptist was referred to as the friend of the bridegroom. Jesus was trying to make it clear, you guys are guests, he's the best man, I'm the groom, I'm going to go get me a bride. But they wanted to be on top. They didn't want to be out of the limelight. And somehow they had cogitated all those years and come up with ideas they were so far afield of what God had in mind, even though the prophets had proclaimed it and the writings had declared it, they missed the point. It's exciting to think that we're on the verge of the bridegroom coming and getting us out of here. <laughs> it's going to be a good day, and I don't think it's going to be too far hence. Chapter 4 begins with the words, Come up hither. We see in that a picture of the rapture. This is the things which shall be hereafter. The things which are, the, you've seen, the glorified Christ, the things which are, which was the church age set, for us, set before us in chapters 2 and 3, and the things which shall be hereafter begin in chapter 4, and it begins with a come up hither. It become, begins with a rapture. He says in verse 2 of chapter 4, immediately I was in the spirit and before the throne uh, bef and, and behold a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne and so forth. This is where it really begins to get real for the people on the earth. Extreme times demand extreme measures. I believe we're seeing a lot of extreme measures being taken by the Lord even as we speak. Between the two huge hurricanes and devastations thereof recently and the lurking supervolcano out of Yellowstone and looking at the fires on the West Coast and the laws that are being passed in our country to thumb our noses in spite of God's declaration that he is not pleased with a people, that when a people's ways please, pre, uh, please the Lord, he makes even his enemies uh, to be at peace with him. Uh, these are things that we have decided we don't need anymore. We don't need God. So we're asking him to see himself to the door. In recent days, I just read this past week, it came out in the news that in California, or I think, yes, yeah, the entire state, they have made a law that you can be imprisoned if you will not use uh, gender, if you use gender specific language. <laughs> so if you call him a him and her a her, or somebody who wants to be something other, if you don't call them what they, they can imprison you for this. Look it up. It is strange days indeed. And I want to suggest to you that as we go through this, you're going to see some of the correlations of the Word of God with the contemporary events of our day, and it will kind of set you back on your heels, but also, hopefully, it will bolster your faith. Chapter 4, set before us the Lord Jesus. He comes, uh, uh, he's the throne sitter. We see him in, in the colors of the throne sitter. Not going to go into that, you've got to go back and review it. And then we see everybody praising the throne sitter as the creator in verse 11 of chapter 4. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. The Bible says in Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In John chapter 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was nothing made that was made. And the Word that made all these things became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, uh, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the Creator. 
Jesus is the one being praised in chapter 4 and verse 11. Chapter 5 takes us into the throne room in a different way because now it says that there's a throne sitter, but there's also somebody else. If we were to outline this a little bit more deliberately for you today, we could say that this chapter begins with what we might call a a declaration or a proclamation. Uh, the proclamation goes out in verse 2, who is worthy to open the book, because a book is seen. It's a scroll, literally, and this scroll is there, and it, the question is, who is worthy to open it? And John weeps desperately in verse 4, because nobody is found worthy. Finally, one of the elders taps him on the shoulder and says, Don't weep, because the lion of the tribe of Judah, verse 5, the root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Understand, this is a proclamation that is twofold. One is, who is worthy? And another proclamation, the lamb is worthy. So we have a proclamation. Then we have the revelation. Verse 6 says, "And and And I beheld, and in the midst of the throne... Uh, of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Now notice about this, and I tried to make it uh, make a point of this, and I don't think I did it as successfully as I'd like to, but I'd like for you to look at verse 6 where it says, There stood a lamb as it had been slain. Now, the word literally has the idea of immediately, as if he had just been slain. And I think the takeaway from that is that Jesus' crucifixion, listen, will never, ever be old news. Okay? He is the crucified Lamb of God. He bears the marks in his body. His wounds plead for us. And when those in the throne room here see him, they see him as a lamb. Uh, he, they see the, he sees the lamb as it had been slain. Not as if, because he was, but it's as he had been slain. The idea for John is he sees him for what he has done for us. That is always present tense. When we come to the Lord's Supper, what do we do? We remember his wounds, his body broken for us, his blood shed for us, this do in remembrance of me. And when you see him in his lamb-like condition or his lamb-like apparition or appearance, you see Jesus as a lamb, as a lamb slain. And so when we come to that, just remember, he's not just a lamb. He's also the lion of the tribe of Judah. Very important to keep that in the back of your mind because the lion is about to roar. (laughs) And the people of earth will know it's him when he does. We'll see that in a moment. The second thing I want you to see is I give you a little flyby of the rest of chapter 5 that I did not get to before. The Bible says that in verse 7, he came and took the book or the scroll out of the hand of him on the throne. And says, and when he had taken the book, the, the, the beasts and the four and twenty elders, that's the church, representative of the church, they fell down before the Lamb, having everyone harps uh, and golden vials full of incense, if you will, odors or incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So what you see here is you see that these twenty-four elders play a role in praise and in prayers, Okay? This is why the Bible says we need to be praying. The Bible says, I would that men everywhere pray always, lifting up holy hands. Why is it that we are so afraid of prayer? What is it that that troubles us about being on our knees or being among the saints of God and calling uh, calling up to heaven for for aid and for uh, strength and for encouragement and consolation and for souls? You see, the devil comes against prayer because he can't stand it when we kneel, (laughs) okay? It it just is is a weapon he has nothing against. The Bible talks about our weaponry being the Word of God and all prayer. We have two weapons, if you will, the Word of God and all prayer, the sword of the Spirit and our time on our knees. We need to be more about that. In heaven, we'll understand it better by and by. They're all falling on their knees, and they have 
prayers, which are represented in the odors or the incense, and they have uh, harps, which means they're going to be praising the Lord. Look in verse 9, it says they sung a new song, and this is important because it helps us know who these elders are. These elders are represented as those who sing a song that says, You were slain, and you have redeemed us to God by the blood, by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And you made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth. This is good stuff, guys. Do you want to see a photograph and see you in there? That's you. You get to praise God. You get to sit around the throne. You get to pull up a chair. My little granddaughter was in Sunday school this morning, literally sitting on Ryan's lap and leaning forward and just looking at me. Just looking at me as I was talking. I thought, man, that's what I want to do when I get home. I'm going to lean in and look at Jesus when I'm around the throne in those 24 thrones. You say, why 24? Well, because we got other things to do too. So we're all going to take our turn and then we'll start all over again. But we're going to be able to get right up close and personal. Revelation 20 says that we shall see God's face. Why? Because we're going to be right in there. It's a good day that we have to look forward to. So we see these elders singing the song that reveals better, even better how, who they are, and that is those who were redeemed. So this is the redeemed. The church has been raptured, chapter 4 and verse 1, and now we're all sitting around the throne. One of the great missing parts of people's Christian life is that they don't know what they have to look forward to. The Bible says, I had not seen, ear had not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man. The things that God has prepared for them that love Him. Beloved, you and I have an awesome future. The Bible says, In God's presence is fullness of joy, and at His right hand are pleasures forevermore. The Bible also says that everlasting joy will be upon our brow. We're looking for a day when we get home when we get to just take a big sigh of relief, we've laid down the sin nature which has dogged our trail. Paul, Paul called it the body of this death. He said, even the Apostle Paul said, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And then he said, I thank God through Jesus Christ. And he tells us there in very clear terms that we have a, 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 a body that is dogging our trail on a routine basis, but there's coming a day here we see we're going to be seated in the very throne room of God. And we're going to reign on earth. So they're in heaven, but they're coming back. That's another indicator to take away. Uh, if you go down into verse, uh, verse 11, he said, I heard many angels, the beasts and the elders, and 10,000 times 10,000, thousands of thousands, we're talking millions of, of uh, created beings, and they're all saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. This is what He's worthy to receive. And all creation enters into the refrain. Something to keep in mind here is Romans chapter 8, verses 19 through 22. Scribble that down. Go read it later. Romans 8, 19 through 22. The Bible says that the creation was subjected to vanity, not willingly, but because God decided that He would let it be so until the day when the people of God who would be redeemed would be restored. So all creation groans now. What does it mean to be subject to vanity? It means that the creation right now, meaning all of the animals, they don't have anybody telling them what they got to do. When you see a bunch of, uh, 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 of uh, pelicans or pigeons down here, or what are they? They're seagulls down here at the, at the uh, Walmart parking lot, you know, rooting around. What are they doing there? <laughs> they think it looks like the sea, that big old black top out there. And they're down there thinking, this is hard, I don't get it. But they're confused. But in that day, we'll be able to say, guys, it's over there. You know, they'll say, oh, got it, <laughs> and we're going, and they'll find the water. Guys, listen, the world in which we live is messed up. People say, well, if God's who He is, why is the world so bad? That's like going to the local junkyard and saying, if, 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 you know, if Christ is so good, what's, why is that mini bad so mangled? Well, somebody mangled it. We mangled it. And we continue to mangle it. But Jesus is going to come and He's going to fix it. <laughs> he's going to make everything right. And that's what this particular book is all about. So every creature is saying something. 
Uh, verse tw- uh, 14 says, And the beasts say amen. The four and twenty elders, again, they become front row because they're, per- they're, they're, they're pulled out specifically because they are the bride of Christ and they have seats around the throne. And it says these twenty-four elders worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Now, chapter 6, I just wanted to give you that quickly. That was the celebration. We saw the proclamation. We saw the revelation of the Lamb and the Lion. And we saw the celebration of everybody just praising God and saying, you should pull the trigger on this. But notice, chapter 4 at the end, it says you created. In chapter uh, 5, it says you redeemed. So he's getting praise for creation and redemption. And all all the creation comes together and says, you're worthy to take to yourself glory, honor, power, and glory, and blessing, all those things. Why? Because Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit are reluctant, are reluctant to pull the trigger on this. Because He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But as things have gotten so bad on earth, uh, it's time. And all of heaven is in agreement. Chapter 6 tells us what happens with this scroll. Now, as I begin this, I want you to remember, um, people today are thinking about this. There are so many apocalyptic TV shows and movies, it is not funny. Uh, Everything from Walking Dead uh, to a show called The Leftovers, which tells us 5%, the the theme of the TV show is 5% of of the world's population disappear, and everybody's left over. And they make fun and chide, I guess, the whole idea of the, of the, um, of the tribulation. There's a movie called uh, Rapture Palooza, which makes fun of uh, the rapture and actually has some of its characters, evidently. I've heard on Jan Markell, she says they have one of their characters actually shoots Jesus by accident as he's returning with a bazooka on earth. This is your world. They take uh, those things that are sacred, holy, and to be feared, and they make uh, light of them. And they also, by doing so, inoculate people to the seriousness of what they will face. So when we come to this, I want you to know most people don't think they have anything to worry about. And I'm reminded of the young man who was on a work site And he was boasting about how he was strong and he could do so much more than anybody else on the team. And he actually was chiding one of the older guys. And he was saying, you know, I got this strength and there's none of you can outwork me and I can do anything. And finally, the old guy stood up and he said to the young buck, he said, listen, he said, I'll bet you a week's wages. I'll bet you a week wages that I can put something in a wheelbarrow, roll it across the lot here on the other side that you can't put back, bring back in the well barrel. And he says, you're on. And so he says, all right. He grabbed this wheel barrel and he says, get in. Let's go. <laughs> he can't bring himself back. Guys, listen. The world in which we live think that they've got it all going on. They think that somehow they got nothing to worry about. They boast as if there's nothing to fear. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And what we have in these verses before us right now is the beginning of sorrows on earth. And it is God's wake-up call. It is God's invitational to people uh, to be saved now and especially in the days that these things take place. The Bible says in verse 1, I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. Uh, One of the four beasts saying, Come and see. Interesting John standing there. He's watching everything, as you may. You know, something very interesting. If you've ever watched a magician, you're trying to find the things going on. Well, this is far above and beyond anything like that. This is the real deal, supernatural thing going to happen. Jesus takes and he breaks the first seal. Now, remember the way that this scroll is, is that it is in the Roman times, they would seal a book, unfurl it by breaking a seal, getting to a second seal. Then they would uh, break the second seal and be able to read the next portion. The first seal has now been broken of this seven-sealed scroll. When it was broken, John says, I saw, and behold, verse 2, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, interesting thing about this guy is he's on a white horse. Back when I was a kid, the guy who was wearing the white hat was the good guy. (laughs) 
We used to believe that, see that. It was always clear. Who's the good guy? It's the guy wearing the white hat. Now it's all confused and whoever's wearing whatever and everybody's immoral and ungodly and even the hero tends to be fraternizing and, and, and chasing skirts and drinking hard and living hard and going out and winning every battle he fights and he's the hero. But he's not a good man. He's just a man. And he kind of makes everybody identify with him as if they could do the same thing. My point is... This man is on a white horse because he presents himself as a good guy. Now, what's more significant is, is that we're told that when Jesus comes in chapter 19, he will break through the sky and he will be riding upon a white horse. And that means that this guy is trying to uh, suggest that he is the Messiah. He becomes a false Messiah. Now, what we saw in chapter 4 and verse 1 is that John heard a voice saying, Come up hither, and we were raptured out. And after that happens, what do you really think would happen on the earth if a great, good portion of the world's population literally vanished in a rapture? As Enoch, who walked with God and was not, we who know him will walk with God now and will one day be caught up. The Bible says that the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we who are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord will be caught up together with those dead in Christ. Uh, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that this mortal will in a moment and a twinkling of an eye put on immortality. That's what it says. In a moment and a twinkling of an eye is going to put on immortality. And it says this, and corruption will put on incorruption, and death is going to be swallowed up of life. We're going to be in His presence immediately. That is a good day. I want to be in that number <laughs> when the saints go marching in. It's going to be a good day. But what we see now is the, re uh, the repercussions. If I could, the repercussions. Because what we have in this chapter are two movements. One is repercussions, and the other is recognitions. The first is the horse, the white horse, and the white horse rider. Now, we can connect these white horses uh, to Zechariah 1 and Zechariah 6. If you want to put them somewhere and think about that later... But what we find is that the horses in their color represent uh, the four spirits of God, according to Zechariah 6.5. So if the Antichrist is riding on one of them, what does that tell us? Well, what that tells us is what we have now is a convergence of the providence of God with the contrivances of Satan. Now, that's a sentence for you. You'll have to go back and revisit that. The, the, the providence of God with the contrivances of Satan's, Satan and the impudence of man. It's all coming together. What we have is we have this, this convergence. And this convergence represents for us a, a movement of God in His sovereignty in real time on the earth. The white horse, the red horse, the black horse, the pale horse, they all are seen in, Ze in Zechariah. And they represent the four spirits of God. They run to and fro in the earth. But what we have now is that the Antichrist is given a crown. Did you see that in verse 2? It says, He that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given to him. Psalm 75, verses 6 to 8, talks about the fact that promotion or uh, exaltation comes from the Lord. He lifts up one, and he puts down another. And if you read it all, Psalm 75, verses 6 to 8, you find out that it is because of judgment that God brings in one and puts down another. Very interesting. You need to read that. I don't have time. Psalm 75, verses 6 to 8. Remember that because this is what happens. God is given this man a place and a time. We will see him later in chapter 13 as the Antichrist. The fact that he comes riding on a white horse shows us he will come as a, uh, as a usurper, if you will. The devil has always said it this way, uh, I will be like the Most High. That's his goal. I will ascend to the heights. I, I will make, my, I will make my, uh, my abode in the throne of the, of the high places and I'm going to ascend. I'm gonna, I will, I will, I will. And, and his desire is to usurp the throne of God, ultimately. And here we see him coming and usurping the place of, of, of a Messiah. And he says, and it says, he that sat on him had a bow. Now, this man 
false Christ. He's going to come as a deliverer. He's going to have answers. A rapture's taken place. Probably some chaos in the world. And subsequently, he comes into, into his own at just the right time and on, uh, at, the, at, the, uh, at the behest or at the permission, uh, with the permission of God himself. It, because he's riding on that white horse. He has a crown that was given to him. The crown is not a diadem, which is a kingly crown. It is a, a Stephanus, which is one of those wreath, wreath crowns you see in Roman games. This is a won crown. This is one that he won by exploits. And there are three things about him that I found fascinating in my study. The Bible says he went forth in verse 2. That means this is something he had already done. It's almost like his, his past is there. He went forth, and it says conquering, which is something he does presently. And then in the future, it says, and to conquer. He went forth, conquering, and to conquer. In other words, it's very likely that the Antichrist is on the international scene today. And it's very likely that all of the conquests that he has personally achieved will win him great favor, the crown, the Stephanus, with the world's crowd. They're going to love him already. And subsequently, he went forth to conquer. That was his goal all along. And then subsequently, it says conquering, and that's what he always wanted to do. And it says, and to conquer, because that's certainly what the devil's going to want to be uh, having him do. In Revelation chapter 13, we're going to find out that this uh, man is referred to as a beast, because that's his personal nature from heaven's perspective, and that he will literally be empowered by the dragon, which is the devil, that old serpent. You'll see that when we get there. But he has a, a bow. The thing about a bow is, is that a bow means that I mean, he's going to have victory but he's going to be personally removed from the slaying that's done. He launches arrow, arrows and they find their mark. I can't help but think about how our country is right now in an uproar. How our country right now has people on the streets burning buildings, uh, besmirching the First Amendment, uh, the freedom of our speech, coming against everything constitutional, and young people are buying it hook, line, and sinker, and what's ending up happening is we have a whole group of young people coming up who will be my age in, not the, too, in the not-too-distant future, and they will be voting and pulling the trigger on a whole lot of evil if, it, if God tarries that long. But when this man comes... Everybody's going to like him. He's going to have a white horse. He's going to be a deliverer. He's going to fix many of the problems that will perhaps result as a result of the rapture. There's going to be chaos because when he comes, he aims at certain targets and he, he, he never misses. He puts something into motion and it occurs. And you can plug in who you want, but there are a lot of leaders on the international scale right now that could be this person. We will not know for sure who he is, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, until the rapture has occurred. Because after the restrainer is taken out of the way, the Bible says, then the Antichrist will be revealed, uh, and we will see him, and the man of sin will be revealed. So, we'll put that on the side. The first seal's been broken. The convergence of God's providence and man's and, and Satan's contrivances, okay? This is happening. And subsequently, God lets him arrive into a very high and lofty place in the international scene. Uh, the second uh, seal is broken in verse 3. It says, And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say. say. Now, there's only four beasts. And he says, The second beast is now stepping forward and saying, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given unto him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. This, in a word, is war. Okay? So the Antichrist comes, the rapture comes, the Antichrist arrives, and now, because of his desire to have a dominion over the entire world, he stirs things up, and war breaks out. 
You know, there's many times that war breaks out in the earth because it helps bring stability and unity, you know, and everybody says, okay, we're going to be building bombs and tanks and we got people. But this, this war is different than that because it's partly that, but there's going to be more than that because verse 4 says they will kill one another. Did you see what happened in Las Vegas? The one man killed all those people. Do you see what's happening on the streets of our universities? People go to speak on a conservative issue and there are riots in the streets and the people have to be spirited away because they're in danger for their lives. Do you see what happens in, in places like, uh, like after Katrina and Irma? People are looting, taking stuff from one another. When things come apart, uh, the true nature of man comes out. And the Bible says that in this uh, stage of the unfolding of this seven-year tribulation, uh, what we find, Antichrist rises, and then war breaks out, and it takes peace from the earth. They're going to kill one another internationally by virtue of wars, but also socially on the grassroots. People will not trust one another, much like you and I feel today. If you're driving down the road and your car runs out of gas, you're a little worried. You do have a cell phone, so frankly, you don't expect anybody to stop. When I was a kid, we would hitch a ride and not worry about it. Things were different. Now, if you hitch the ride, you'd be worried that somebody's going to get you and he's a, he's a murderer, some kind of a mass murderer. But what I want you to know is that in these days, men's hearts will faint because of the fear that is in them. Uh, you know, there is a whole lot going on in our world that makes us all nervous. What happened in Las Vegas shows us that what happened there could happen anywhere. And what we had down in, uh, I believe it was Cincinnati or Columbus, where the, uh, where the guy walks into the restaurant and began to cut people up with his sword and was uh, chased out with people throwing chairs at him or something. He, got, he was put down later. He was an Islamic terrorist who literally made an attack in a restaurant, just people minding their business. You remember the shooter in the, in the uh, theater. You went, the people go to see a movie, and then some guy brings a gun in and starts shooting everybody. Everybody's signing up to be uh, concealed carry today because they're worried something's going on. And the far left is saying, hey, let's get rid of the guns, not thinking that you know, maybe it was the shooter, not the gun. You see, the implement is handled by people. And what happens is, is that we have people turning on each other. This red horse rider takes peace from the earth and, they would, and that they should kill one another and there was given unto him a great sword. So this is going to be an international outbreak of anarchy and it's going to be a time that's going to even get worse. It starts with war. It starts with war in the streets, probably among the races. And also it's going to be uh, people who are uh, you know, involved in, 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 in ter turf war and so forth like that. So what we see in verse 5 now is he turns from this peace being taken from the earth. And the natural consequence of what we might call war is that there's going to be famine. The Bible says in verse 5, And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances. Uh, these are scales, if you will. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil in the wine. Now a measure is like a liter. It's not a quart, it's less than a quart, and it's a liter, let's say, of, of wheat. Now wheat is good grain, barley is the poor man's grain, so for a penny, which in their day was a day's wage. So if you make $150 in a day as your wage, uh, you could say $150 for just one meal. Because one measure would make enough food for one person if they were going to eat, you know, kind of carefully. One measure, one meal. So if he has a family, he may opt to get, take that one day's wage and buy enough food to pay uh, to get three measures so that he, he and his one child perhaps can eat. But here's what it says. It says, not only is this going to be true, he says, but uh, it says, see thou hurt not uh, the oil and the wine, which means the rich man will have his. Okay? Rich people will still have their oil and their wine. They'll be living in the lap of luxury. They'll be on top of the heap. And believe you me, there are many people today who are already preparing 
to have that position. And you'll see that if you come back tonight uh, to see what people are doing who are in the high lofty positions uh, making arrangements to move away from uh, where harm might be coming very shortly. But I'll hold that for a moment. So it says now we have war, uh, we have a, conquer a deliverer, we have war, and then we have famine. Uh, war often brings famine. But for some reason, somebody's trying to gain hold of the entire earth, which would be the white rider, and it's creating war and uprisings. You can't imagine the, the Soviets getting along with the Chinese, getting along with the Americans, getting along with the uh, Europeans. You know, everybody's got their thing. The Indian people, you know, all these different things, and there's different ideas of how things should be. But the Antichrist is going to come, and he's going to make sure that things move in the right direction. He's shooting arrows. He's kind of conducting the symphony of things going on, it would seem. And you'll see that more in chapter 13. But verse 9 says, uh, actually, I don't want to skip this. Verse 7 says, And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, in a, and behold, a pale horse. Now, I want you to understand the word pale has the idea of a decaying, greenish-yellow color. Think of putrefying flesh. Think of what is depicted, perhaps, in zombies. This pale horse is gross to look at. And he comes as the fourth horse. And there are only four in number. And it says, he comes as a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him, or Hades followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth. Get that. A fourth part of the earth is going to be in upheaval. To kill with the sword, and with hunger, and with death, and look at this, and with the beasts of the earth. Imagine, you can't even trust your own animals. Imagine that when you see you know, like deer. You, you know deer will attack, right? They will. I didn't know this until a few years ago. Well, I looked it up and I found, yes, they will attack and they will do it furiously. Think about this. No mating season, just insanity among the animals. Tooth and claw unleashed. Wherever you go, uh, animals in the street, dogs and cats and even, you know, any other kind of animal, even birds. You know, I remember when I was a kid, man. Remember that? The birds, that movie? Whoa, you know, the birds are coming down, but the Bible says they're going to be killed by the beasts, too. So it's a real time of anarchy. It ramps up from war and anarchy in the local level, and it says that these uh, two writers, this one writer that has hell following after him, will, take, uh, will, will have power over a fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword. There is war, and it also, by the way, that word kill literally means to offer a sacrifice it means to slay. It is taken from a word that has the idea, get this, of to slit the throat. This is slaughter. This is only used in the book of Revelation, and it's used like nine times, and one other time. And the other time it's used is in 1 John chapter 3, where it says that Cain slew Abel. You remember what Cain and Abel had going on? They brought their sacrifices. One brought fruits and vegetables, the works of his hands. And the fruit of the ground, and that was Cain. Abel brought a bloody sacrifice. Imagine a hunter with a lamb on the front of a, a deer on the front of his truck. He's all proud of this tongue hanging out. Look what I got, you know. Well, Abel had a heart for God, and he understood that when God covered mom and dad's nakedness after they fell, that God had to kill an animal. And as he had been told the stories around the fireside, evidently made the connection that God covered their nakedness by taking the life of an animal to cover it, I'm going to re-echo that. I'm going to take a lamb, and I'm going to lift its innocent little head. Now, this was before animals were afraid of man. I'm going to lift its little head, I'm going to cut its throat, and I'm going to catch the blood, and I'm going to say, God, I know, I know that I deserve judgment. And that's what we say today. We know it. We're sinners. He said, I know it, and I'm going to ask you to just take this lamb as a sacrifice. And the Bible says that because God had respect to Abel's intuitiveness and his heart and his connecting of the dots, and that, that it made Cain jealous, 
And Cain was envious and angry, and the first brother rose up against the second brother, because Cain was the elder, and in the field, he slit his throat, just like Abel had slit the throat of the animal. These people are going to think they're doing God a service when they kill people in that day, in many instances. They're going to kill uh, one another. So there's the sword, and it says they were, all, they were able to kill with the sword, with hunger, because we have the scale problem a moment ago, and with death, because there's going to be death and disease and pestilence. You know, when you turn off, uh, when you shut down the highways, the food doesn't get through. You always see those pictures, like when, when uh, this last hurricane, Irma, was the last one. Is that the one in Florida, or is it the other way around? One of them. Uh, comes into Florida, everybody goes in and there's a run on water and food and the, and the stores are shutting down. They're getting out of Dodge. And then people get angry, but after a while, they, they, they get from anger, they go to hunger and they start saying, I want something. They kill each other. It says, and with death, so there's pestilence. People are dead. Nobody's burying them. There's nothing in order. And the Bible says, and with the beasts of the earth. So this is a pretty big deal. This is the four horses of the apocalypse you've always heard about. And you can see the continuum of deliverer, war, uh, famine, and then anarchy. It's unfolding right before us. These are all a convergence of the providence of God with the contrivances of Satan. He's loving this. The devil loves the murder and the mayhem. He loves it. He laughs with glee. The Bible says the devil was a murderer from the beginning. And he was a liar. And he comes to steal and kill and to destroy. And he's coming as a false shepherd, if you will, according to John 10. And we see that Jesus, however, as the good shepherd, gave himself, his life for the sheep. So when we trust him, we don't have to worry about these things because we're not going to be here. And that's good to know. But that is not all the seals. That's only four. And it's bad. This is taking place over the course of probably about three and a half years. And we'll see why here in a moment. But we believe that this represents for us in breakneck speed what is known as in Revelation or in Matthew chapter 24, what is known as the tribulation. It will then give way to the great tribulation. And so this is that first half where it's just man getting what he wants and turning everything inside out and upside down. Lawlessness. Does that sound familiar? You know when these players take a knee in the NFL? You know? There's a rule about that, just like there's a rule about deflating the ball, you know, messing with the infl inflation of the ball, which somebody got uh, reprimanded really so severely not long ago. Well, these guys are taking a knee, and they're not even coming out to the national anthem. There's a rule about that. They can be fined, uh, and yet they're, being, they're looking the other way. Why? Because lawlessness is the, uh, is the rule of the day. That is in America where law and love for God and right and wrong has been defined well for years, centuries really, a couple centuries now. Now, not so much. And when we fall, the rest of the world is going to look just like we do because we're going to look like they are. And we're going to look just like that, the rest of the world. And what I want you to see is that this is what's happening. The rapture happens, the Antichrist comes, and all this stuff unfolds. But in verse 9 it says, And when the Lord Jesus opened the fifth seal... I saw under the altar souls, the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. These are martyrs uh, from the tribulation. These are not martyrs of the church age. We've already been raptured. The dead in Christ rose, and those who were alive and remain were caught up. We're sitting around in the 24 elder seats. These are people under the altar. Why an altar? Well, because an altar is where sacrifices are made. And these guys were having to sacrifice their lives to maintain their testimony because what they were saying was, I believe what happened was the rapture. I believe this is God's hand turning the tables over on us on earth. And so what he does is, what the world does is, is the world comes in and begins to kill people who will not get in line with them. And in the first three and a half years, we saw the anarchy. They're going to kill one another. And as I said about the slaying with the cutting of the throat, that comes into play. You see why. You see, for the first three and a half years, people are going to be given a green light to kill one another. Those especially that do not get in lockstep with the rest of the world. 
Venezuela, I believe it was, recently just passed their own law where they were coming unglued. And so the guy who was in charge down there gave the order that it was okay to kill uh, with impunity anyone that did not get in lockstep. So you see microcosm to macrocosm. The big picture is where it happened on a little scale, it's now going to happen on a large scale. The Antichrist or the powers that be, at this point it could be the Antichrist with others in the kings of the, uh, of the, of the Confederacy we're going to see later. They all get together, they say it's okay, and subsequently many martyrs, many people are going to be killed, and they're being killed for one reason, for the Word of God and the testimony which they held, which means they held to the Word of God. Now, guys, we don't have to pay much for our walk with God today. I mean, it's hard to get out of bed in the morning. Oh, 15 more minutes, please. Boy, what a day. We're going to feel bad looking back on it. We'll say, man, I really missed the boat on that. But the fact is, is that these people are not going to be able to be casual about their faith. It's going to cost them something. Even as it does in some, some nations today, whether it's Muslim nations and where Muslims have come to Christ and they've been killed, or whether it's in some places like India where people are killed because they don't get in their, in lockstep with them, or, or co uh, communist nations like China and Russia where you can be killed because you believe. Uh, in the Bible and take it as God's word. But here it's going to be a national occurrence. And it says these guys are going to say in verse 10, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So they've been students of Scripture. They know there's going to have to be a writing for the blood guiltiness. I want you to know something. We in America right now are living in a culture of death. The abortion problem in our country has mounted to the level of over 60 million babies having been slain since 1973. And God has seen every one of them. I don't weep for the babies. I weep for the, con for the con conscience of the country. Our country has seared its own conscience. We call it a right when it's clearly a wrong. But the Bible tells us that a land will spew its inhabitants out. It will vomit its inhabitants out because the blood will cry for vengeance. These guys are crying in, condition, in co cooperation with God's Word. They're saying, God, you said you're going to right the wrong. You're going to purge the blood. How long? They just want it to happen. Now, when you look at this, I want you to hold on to the thought of the, wor the words vomiting it out. This is what it says in the Bible, that the land vomited out the inhabitants of Canaan. And when Israel came in, because they had been so wicked and debauched, here it says that these guys have been martyred. And they're looking for that judgment that will come to right the wrong. But they were given right, white robes in verse 11. So they weren't even clothed here. They're, God, you're going to go get them? Go get them. I know. We, we seem like long and drawn out for us. But when they arrive, they're given white robes and they're told that they need to rest. Why? Because they need to rest, in verse 11, until their fellow servants also and their brethren should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. Now, what is it that they were killed for? Verse 9, their testimony. You see, these guys are giving their lives as a testimony. The Bible says faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. When people are willing to give their life, that is a substantial picture and a substantial uh, in indication to those who observe that kind of faith. When they're willing to give their life, it's a substantial observation they're making. These people really believe it. Maybe... We need to look at what they believe. Uh, and, and this happened in Rome, when they would see people giving their lives in the Colosseums. And Rome ultimately gave way uh, to the Christian influence, because all of these people had something to die for. But in the tribulation, God's going to let many people become sacrificed to the sword, because they have to give a testimony, and that's God's altar call to that generation. So many are going to be killed. If you want to put in your margin by that, for your comfort, chapter 20 and verse 4 talks about these martyrs being who were beheaded, because that's how they're going to have to die, they're, who were beheaded would be resurrected and given thrones. Chapter 20 and verse 4 of Revelation.
Now the sixth seal is in verse 12. It says, And I beheld, and when he had opened the sixth seal, lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places." Chapter 16 and verse 20 says that they would flee away in the final judgments of the bold judgments. Right here, God's just loosened them up. <laughs> if you've ever tried to do a demo project, you know, you got that two by four, you get that baby loose. Then you bring in the jackhammer. Bam! And that baby's out of there. He's loosening things up with this great earthquake. Now, as far as volcanoes are concerned, I want to bring this in because many people have wondered where's America in the big picture? Where's America in prophecy? Well, it is very likely that America is not here anymore. Some people believe that so many in America, Christians, they're going to be raptured out. i got a question about that. There's a whole lot of people up in uh, Congress I don't think are Christian. I'm just saying. They're voting for death. They're voting for death. They're voting for death. And I'm just sorry. They're not people who are, can be trusted. There's corruption everywhere from, from the bottom to the top. And it is bad. And so we don't really buy that one. But people have suggested that. Where's America? Well, maybe they all got raptured out. All the good people are gone, so they're just kind of non-issue. No, I don't think so. However, the thing that has gotten our attention in recent days is Yellowstone. What is called a supervolcano with a 35 by 45 mile uh, cadera, which is the top of a, of a volcano. It has all kinds of earmarks of that which is about to erupt. It is a continent killer. Imagine, if you would, if this volcano blew, which, by the way, they've had to shut it down several times in recent years. Uh, since 2003, 2004, 2014, all kinds of things have been had because they're looking at this baby and it is moving. Ten centimeters a year it is moving. Already, they can, they can judge that. Ten centimeters, that's about that high. Everything is moving like that. And old, old Faithful, he's, guys, he's blowing up his steam because that's the volcano underneath it. And what it does is that they're, what they're saying is, is that this baby is fixing to blow. They don't know when, but they know it will blow. It's just a matter of time. They at one point thought it might be about 2070. They've revised that by 50 years. They're thinking 2020. They don't know. I'm just telling you what those who are in high positions are saying. If it blows, it will destroy and kill immediately everybody within 100 miles. And everybody within 500 miles would be made sick unto death, a little slower death. And the debris and fallout would mean that people in America on the east side would probably be trying to get away from America. Our country has made agreements with several nations to take the people. If that blows, that's how serious they're taking it. Read it again. A great earthquake. The sun become black as sackcloth of hair. You know what happens, right? Big cloud. This is huge. 35 by 45, it's kilometers, I believe, is the top of it alone. When it goes, what kind of smoke cloud are you going to get out of something like that? The Bible says a great earthquake. This could be America, You're coming from America, pushing everybody into a place of uh, cataclysmic thinking and what do we need to do and we need a leader and so forth, like the guy in, in verse 2. But it says this is happening after all that other stuff. It would seem a continuum because it says that the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became blood. What that means, I believe, if, if we could plug in, the, uh, plug in the, um, uh, the volcano idea, is that that soot is going to be kind of a, a filter when you see the moon, if you see it at all. The Bible talks about it being dark for a third of the day later. Matthew 24 and chapter 24 and 29 talks about this as well, this very same thing. Jesus said this stuff would happen, but here it is. Verse 13 says, And the stars of heaven fell 
uh, under, under the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, as, uh, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Think in terms of lava flying through and falling. It would look like stars falling to uh, John's, uh, John's sensibilities. He doesn't know about airplanes and cars and, and mechanical things. It'll look like fire falling uh, and maybe like stars look when they fall. Verse 14 says, And the heavens departed, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. It's almost like this big cloud coming across, okay? The white sky is like being folded up. <laughs> it's pretty interesting. If you want to see the video, come back tonight on the Yellowstone and what they're saying could happen. What I'm saying to you is, this is a new development. I've been studying this for years, and I've often think, well, maybe it's a nuclear thing, but you know we have this guaranteed mutual destruction doctrine in America, right? They shoot at us, we'll wipe them out as it's coming. So nothing seems to happen like that. This is something that would take America right off of the map and much of Canada and the... And, the, and, uh, and you know there's been clusters, right? 2,500 different earthquakes over the past two or three months. 25 all around the outskirts of Yellowstone. 2,500 earthquakes. Two huge ones down in Mexico. One was an eight and one was a seven. Uh, rec uh, rector scale kind of thing. So we're looking at some pretty serious times. The Bible says that the heaven departed as a, as a scroll rolled together and every mountain and island were moved. God shook them loose. And I put in there 1620 because it tells them they're going to be gone eventually. But right now they're just being shaken loose. And in verse 15 it says, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty man, men, and every bond man, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks and the mountains. Why? Because they said, to, it says because in verse uh, 16, that they said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the day, the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? What's remarkable about this is that they know what's going on. The Left Behind series sold more than any series of novels in the history of printing. People know about the Left Behind series because people read them and people devoured them and people who are lost. In fact, Scott could tell you, he read those babies and by the time I got to him, he says, tell me what do I need to do? <laughs> I need to get saved because he said, this stuff's going to be bad. And a lot of people were in that and maybe didn't have somebody to ask and lead them. What I'm saying to you is, is that it's, as it was said in the days of Noah, it was going to rain, it's going to be bad. People don't believe it's going to rain in the days of Noah. People don't believe this is going to happen in our day. But we've got so many pictures. God bringing everybody to heal with hurricanes and with fires on the East Coast or a West Coast, uh, with, with, with volcanic possibilities and all these earthquakes. And if this earthquake in Yellowstone were to blow as a super volcano could blow, it will affect uh, earthquakes, it will affect uh, volcanoes across the world. They believe there will be a billiard ball effect. It's so big that even on the other side of the earth there could be rumblings that would open up some things there. Guys, Jesus is coming. And we're going to be out of here for this. But there are people that you know who are not saved yet. Might be you today. But there are people you know who are not saved. They need to get saved. And we sit back as Pink Floyd Animals album said, harmlessly passing our time in the grassland away. You want to know what church is about? It's about getting our armor on and getting the message out. Can I get an amen? That's what it is, to get our armor on and the message out. Because we wrestle not against, uh, against flesh and blood, but against principalities and spirit of darkness in high places. We are dealing with the devil today. He is pervasively having a heyday. He is laughing every day when a shooter goes and kills 52 and wounds 500 or so people. When he sees people thinking, well, we're reporting here and we don't know why he did it. Maybe he had a bad day. There's no reason why he did it. It just doesn't make sense. Listen, there's a reason. 
It happened in October, and there's a lot of things that are about that I can't go into right now. But, beloved, we need to get our game faces on. Would you bow with me for a moment? I don't know what that does.